Hi, it's Polly here. So I just wanted to share some tales with you about a, uh, a wonderful eccentric git who was part of um, the fanish and gaming scenes in Melbourne in Australia during the 80s and 90s. Cecil Murgatroyd. What a wonderful name. Okay, so Cecil was actually a New Zealander. He was one of the cronies of the Wizard of Auckland. He was a, he was a um, sub-wizard. And they had an organisation called ALF's Imperial Army. ALF stood for Antipodean Liberation Front. Now, as he explained it, particularly at that stage, New Zealand was very, very sleepy rural. There wasn't a lot to do. So these people sort of found ways of amusing themselves. In theory, ALF's Imperial Army was a reenactment club, and, and, and it actually got some grant money from the government as a sort of New Zealand colonial wars reenactment group. What these idiots would do is... Um, there'd been like a massive uh, loss in population. So lots of um, rental housing was really cheap. So they would rent a house um, somewhere in town and this would be their barracks. And these guys, it was, a, it was a hangout place. And if some of them were down and out, they could actually live in the barracks and look after it. It was kind of an interesting sort of fanish gaming kind of social organisation where, you know, they'd look after their own. But they would wear red jackets and white pith helmets and so on. And would um, you know, run up uh, Union Jacks and generally swan about and be ravening nutters. Um, as Cecil put it, uh, they decided the Queen was coming for a visit and they decided to put on an heroic tableau uh, along the route. So they dressed themselves up as um, some of them as uh, they got Maori, uh, some Maori guys to turn up and they basically posed themselves with Maori's beating the living daylights of these guys, ah, choking them and Maori's running off with like paper mache heads on poles and you know, all this sort of stuff. And Cecil said, the motorcade slowed down and, and from the rolls in the middle, the window went down and this regal female voice says, oh yes, it's you lot again. <laughs> and you see, she treated us as the maniac scum we truly are, and that's why we love her, oh, Cecil. So, um, due, <laughs> due to a few interesting faux pas, he ended up over in um, Australia and was hanging out at the universities and hanging out with the SCA and in the games clubs and the role-playing game community and fanish community, being a general nutter. Now, one of the things that he would do is uh, he ran a silly party in elections i would help him run so i was his election agent and he was the candidate and it was the um Imper imperial british conservative party and it was a a complete piss take on conservative politics there was a pop-up manifesto this wonderful book that you would pop up and lift up flaps and you'd pull little tabs and things and do things and essentially it was explaining that the proper conservative position should be expressed you know in um, achievable goals. So the idea of conservatism was it's going to be the great leap backwards. And so there are these like communist style five year plans to progressively destroy the country and medievalize it into a riotous shit pile of peasants rocking back and forth on piles of dung. Because that's what conservatism actually means, you know, complete destruction of sane society. And the idea was that. Um, everyone would live this happy life because they'd be too stupid to realize that they were miserably unhappy and um everyone would live in these little villages which would be pitted against each other and it was anti-war but pro-nuclear the idea was to have no no weapons worse than a, than a pointed stick but to have a massive nuclear stockpile so if anyone invaded the country they would just blow it up so there's no point in invading it because it would just be an ash pile and um yes it was just completely ridiculous wonderful just insane. Uh, the the fun part of it was, and p w why it was such a wonderful scam was, candidates get to go to like a big uh, lunchy do at the governor's uh, um, mansion, and so we would turn up in red jackets and white pith helmets and so on and um because we were the silly party candidates everyone wanted the photo op with us because it meant you had a sense of humor if you could get photographed next to us. Uh, so essentially. We got to dress up, harangue some crowds, and get a free lunch and um, down a few bottles of shambas on the governor's docket. So it's like, tee hee. Um, Alpha's Imperial Army, by the way, split into wonderful different sub organizations. They made different regiments. So there was um, 
the uh, one of them was oh there was the Dunedin Grenadiers I think and they they had kilts and so on, and then there was a split off from that the Royal McGillicuddy Flying Claymores who were the Air Corps but they were split off from the kilt wearing guys so these are guys in red jackets, kilts and sporans but <laughs> leather flying helmets they're the Air Corps and uh, yeah um, that was um, that was Mergie's mob the Royal McGillicuddy's. Um, we would go to things like SCA Do's and run a tavern, um, which were wonderful. And he, he would just, um, we, would, we would have a grand old time. Murgatroyd had a habit of trying to push the envelope. And he tried to, he, he had, he was fearless. He considered, by the way, he considered me to be a dangerous loony because, you know, I will fearlessly go up on stage or, you know, I will just physically do stuff. I considered him to be a, a wonderfully dangerous loony because he would just, he had no sense of embarrassment and would, he had the talent of taking stuff too goddamn far. So when um, there was like some comets that were supposed to be coming too close, oh, they're going to hit the earth, they're going to do this, Murgatroyd starts racing around the city. He is dressed in nothing but a loincloth and he's towing behind him a cart which has a giant paper mache comet on it and he's running around um, ringing a bell saying that you know the day has come and but what he had was an old um, field army field telephone so he would, he would basically tell people that look it's time now it's time now to repent and to you can't take money with you but you can send it on ahead so that you've got it in heaven when the comet inevitably smashes into earth and you will die. But what you've got to do is sacrifice the money now so that it's there waiting for you. So what he had was this setup where you'd give him like a $5 bill. He would clamp it into this little clamp, physically set fire to it in front of you and burn it to ash. And then he would, you know, work this old field telephone like, hello, yes, God, yes, $5 on the way to the account of, and he would read out your, your account details. Good, God's received it. <laughs> Um, and yes, he gets arrested for like willfully defacing currency. And that's what he wanted. He wanted to be physically dragged into the courts because he's got 500 tons of like newspapers there and his name's in the paper and that's what he wanted. Like I said, uh, an actual loony. Really a complete fearless loony. Um, one of his truly great um, moments was when the aid scare first came... The government's throwing money left, right, and centre at all kinds of different things. They didn't know what to do. So Murgatroyd proposed this this special theatre troupe to bring a message, particularly <laughs> out to the people. He says, what's that? Well, the AIDS is obviously spread through contact. So what we need to do is spread and popularise contactless sex. It's like, oh, well, that, that sounds like just the thing. Do you think it could be popular? He says, it's very popular, it's widely practiced amongst teenagers, but I think what we need to do is let teenagers know that what they're doing is great and that this should just be carried on into adult life and it should just be made like a publicly acceptable thing that everyone can just embrace and enjoy. And so we're going to, well, you know, what do you want the money for? Well, we think this is best carried if we have like a theatrical um, a troupe and we will do like theatrical presentations on, oh that sounds great like, traveling oh, we need to like put this on in different towns and oh absolutely we'll do that so they gave him money and he made a theater troupe that was promoting masturbation <laughs> and they made these <laughs> they made all these t-shirts show uh, get a grip or you know <laughs> john off jill on and <laughs> They had this on the side of a bus and they had songs, they had dances, they had costumes. And, um, of course, eventually the scandal breaks. It's like the government has <laughs> spent thousands to send a, a, a theatre troupe around the country to promote uh, masturbation. Again, up in front of the courts, via the Adesqui. Um, a lovely guy, a lovely guy, but, you know completely barking mad um i was very pleased we had a um a national sort of plebiscite to see if australia wanted to become a republic which it bloody well should but um there were local candidates were elected to go to this huge official caucus where this would be officially discussed and when the tv came on 
I'd kind of lost touch because I'd moved over to Perth. So, you know, I, I'd lost touch with everything that he was doing. They're on television, front and centre, elected as a candidate. There's Murgatroyd. Fantastic. Now, I live in Western Australia. Now, all through the 70s, what had happened was there was a little sheep station up to the north of here. And this sheep station just decided they'd got hit with a ridiculous tax bill for money you know didn't possibly own it was just it's just it's a dot in the middle of nowhere so this guy decided that he was going to secede and declare his place its own country hut river province and he sent official notification to the government that he was doing this and no one answered him and they didn't answer him for years even though he sent constant okay i'm seceding in you know Three years, two years, one year, this is your six month notice and everything. But then the government started sending um, mail back to him and addressing him as Prince Leonard of Hutt River Province and writing this mail to him as Hutt River Province. So he took that to international court as proof that, well, they've recognised me. They've recognised my rank as Prince Leonard and they've recognised the, the sovereignty of um, Hutt River Province. The West Australian government, we're it's, it's WA. It's kind of a laid-back kind of larrikin place. So this was entirely allowed to slide because it was just considered to be bloody funny. And Hutt River Proms became a tourist spot in the middle of nowhere. People would come from like all across the country, across the world to visit this little thing. Now, um, Prince Leonard, I actually knew him. I went up there several times and met him and he was a real showman. He was a delight. Um, and um, but he was, he was a riot because these little micronation groups they all know each other so he would his fishing buddies were like the prince monaco um <laughs> the, the the duke of luxembourg um you know the guys from um, montenegro and you know, they would just well they would all get together so there's all these photos of these guys all just like at hut river province in a tin fishing boat off the coast they're just you know, fishing the snapper off the edge of this guy's sheep station and then they would just go and visit each other um but they would issue passports and things. So Mergi, he got hold of a Hutt River Province passport and he got like a rank in their border patrol. I think it was like a ranger of the Hutt River Province borders. So he came to me and he was like, oh, I, I've got this scam thing going and it's like, mm, I'm, I'm not sure. There's a chance of a lifetime. So, well, you know, what have you done, mate? Because I was off on his reality check. He said, well, what I've done is... um. Well, Gaddafi in Libya has been arranging this whole um, summit of world resistance leaders. And um, so I put in a thing saying I'd be willing to go as leader of the Australian branch of the Antipodean Liberation Front. And I've got an official invite. Um, it's got tickets paid. I'll be flown over to um, Libya and... Um, you know, I'll be staying there at this conference where we discuss how we're going to you know, overthrow the world order and whatever. I said, if I can pull this off, this is a major coup. But if they find out that Alf's Antipodean um, uh, Liberation Front is actually, um, you know, a bunch of loonies in paper mache pithels, you know, they're just going to kill me. Said, but they haven't checked, have they? Yeah. So if they check, it'll only be out you back home. Said, yeah go for it so he went for it and he came back gave me a full report so he flew over there and they accepted his hut river province um passport as an act of protest against your know, evil imperialists so he was very proud he's the only person on earth i think who ever had a hut river province passport actually accepted for international travel it had a, it had a stamp in it you know, get up these libyan border guard says yay um but he said it was the dullest two weeks of his life because he says he's there in a hotel room and says he's in a hotel room filled with murderers you know people who actually run terrorist organizations says i half suspect the americans are going to blow the whole whole hotel up at any given time but we're being constantly taken out and bundled off on tours to see you know a glorious cement factory and be told about the cement making process and how much more cement they've been making now than they did two years ago and now, you know, here is a giant new airfield that is being made with the cement. Gosh, how, and now 
And of course, he's asked what the um, what the anthem of um, and the uh, Alice Imperial Army is, and all he could think of was the Liberty Bell March. And of course, the Liberty Bell March. You'll see it in American Navy stuff a lot, in a lot of old movies. You know, you'll get da 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 dun 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 da 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 What you don't really hear is the next bit, which is the Monty Python theme song. Da dun da 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 dun da dun. But that was all he could remember. So they all sat there solemnly, hands over hearts, while if the Monty Python theme song is played for him, so he got out of there alive. Um. So unfortunately, um, Mergy actually died of cancer. Hmm. 20 years ago now I think which is a damn shame tribute to the guy that Melbourne fandom just turned out to the funeral um, people in white pith helmets and you know ridiculous outfits and um, Star Trek people turned up in Star Trek um, uniforms Alps Imperial Army people turned up in you know pith helmets and, and red coats um, war gamers everyone turned up um, the last post was played over his grave by a band uh, all playing kazoos, uh, which um, he, he would definitely have appreciated. An interesting man who sure as hell made his mark in, in fandom. Uh, Mergi, we miss you. You were a loony, but you were a happy loony. God bless. <laughs>